Welcome to another discussion of Jane Eyre. This time we will look at how Jane Eyre thinks about death and life, as well as winter and spring. She doesn't see them as separate at all, but continually working together. There is always some interplay between death and life in winter and summer as they coexist. Many times the winter is seen as negative, but there are always positive reminders of the summer before. That is a recognition that the winter will end and the summer will have been returned for the next season. Watching and experiencing death is a rare event in the modern Western culture. Even taking care of the old and crippled has been regulated to the periphery of our lives. Unless someone is a doctor or a caregiver, the average person is not going to be there or witness sickness and death. The concept of death and serious illness has become a passing curiosity or even a horror. Suffering has become an imaginative fear that it is going to happen to us someday. Unless a person is actually dying themselves, or is of senior age, nobody thinks about that eventuality. Those who do think about it are often looked at as a strange and morbid personality. The sick are placed in small rooms among the company of others that are in the same ill health condition and under the care of capable strangers. The old are shuttered away in homes to be taken care of by people who don't have any personal relationships or connections. Up until the 20th century, mortality rates were very high. There were not very many hospitals to send the sick or any homes to place those who have become feeble in age. Doctors were called in to take care of the sick right there at home. Most people died at home while being looked at and attended to by family members and home visiting doctors, who some were very intimate and friendly with the families. Of course, that doesn't mean that the doctors were knowledgeable about the human body enough to take care of the sick and cure them. In fact, because they weren't as helpful as the modern doctors we now have, there was a lot more familiarity with the death of a sick person. We may be able to cure people of diseases to protect against death more than they were before and have lower mortality rates. But the interpersonal skills related to those who are dying is, well, almost non-existent. Some people would even say that this contributes to the death of those who otherwise might be able to survive. The author of Jane Eyre, Charlotte Bronte, had two of her own sisters die at boarding school where her and three sisters attended. She was very aware of what it was like to lose a beloved relative and friend to death and sickness. The circumstances in the novel were very similar to how the sisters became sick and died. In the case of the novel, the students contracted typhus. Spring arrives at Lowood and there is a spirit of playfulness and comfort. The previous months of winter and cold, including an unrelenting wind with frost and snow, had finally come to a close. There was now green plants, growing flowers, and clear skies. The fields open up for playing and a sense of enjoyment for the first time. The harsh realities of boarding school are made more tolerable. The return of summer, however, masks the darker location of the school in a forested area. Among the rolling fields and many trees, spring fog would roll out from the forest, and with it, pestilence. This brought disease and sickness to children. The great sunshine and beauty during the summer months is overshadowed by the death of students. Even the flowers that are admired for their beauty do nothing to help the victims. They are no good for curing or for pain. They can only be used as a way to mourn the day when a child dies and is placed in their coffins. The flowers and the plants become nothing more than a memorial to the terrors that are happening within Lowood Institution. None of this seemed to affect Jane Eyre. As she went out into the forest, crossed a stream, and sat on this large rock with one of her new friends. Despite her friendship with Mary Ann Wilson, she did not forget Helen Burns, the first girl she talked to at Lowood when she first arrived. She liked Mary Ann very much and would joke with her and have fun. She just didn't see her as a very deep person who she could share important questions and deep thoughts with. All her time was spent in the summer thinking about Helen Burns in the back of her mind. She wanted desperately to go to her friend and talk with her. That was not easy or often possible to do, because her friend was dying. Unlike the other children that she was with in school who contracted typhus, 
Helen had been ill for a very long time. She had contracted what is known as consumption. And at that time, it was a term that covered a wide range of breathing and lung problems. Probably the most possible is pneumonia, as it often can be taken care of today and survived, but during the time of the novel, it was very dangerous. Even today, someone can die of pneumonia if not taken care of properly. During the 19th century and before, it was basically a death sentence. Because of her condition, Helen was separated from the general population of the school. This included both those who were sick and those who were healthy. The sick were in a basement while Helen was put into an upper room. Jane Eyre wasn't even allowed to go to her room and visit. She had become like a ghost and was described as something like a paranormal phantom. At times, there was only a glance of Helen observed from a window staring out. At other times, she would be taken down to a garden area and sit alone with an attendant, having no one else to come close to her. She was often seen wrapped in clothing, as if ready to be placed into a tomb. The ghost imagery continues to show up because Jane Eyre seems obsessed by those who have crossed over to the other side. Perhaps it has to do with her ghost vision in the Red Room so many years ago at the Gateshead Hall. At any rate, she only sees Helen from a distance, almost like a dream, with no contact. It is very much a ghost situation brought to life. For some reason, Jane Eyre is not shown as very worried that she would get sick. Perhaps it has something to do with her age and her inability to grasp the seriousness of what is happening all around her with others. All that is about to change when a doctor arrives to Lowood and goes directly upstairs to visit Helen, where she's being kept. Suddenly, it dawns on Jane all the talk about heaven and hell and what comes after life. She becomes horrified at the thought that her friend is going to die. This thought takes over her and she has a moment of chaos which makes her insides burst with fear and regret. She does compose herself and decide to visit her friend before she dies. She thinks that that is a must because soon Helen will not be here. In her mind, the decision has been made. It doesn't matter if anyone says that she can't. She is going to visit. She will confront death in the form of Helen Burns. At night in the darkness of the hallways and walking upstairs, she enters a lit room with fresh air coming in. The scene of death seems more comfortable than the rest of the school at night. She talks to Helen, who is not worried because there is something better coming after this life. She begs Jane not to mourn for her death. That night, Jane lies down with and embraces death, literally and figuratively. By the next morning, Helen has died in her arms. There's no scenes of mourning or talk of emotional devastation. All that remains is a description of where Helen was buried in a heap of dirt. Years later, a stone is placed at the head of her burial, presumably by Jane Eyre herself. There's no explanation about why she was buried in the manner that she was or how the stone ended up eventually being placed on that spot. That is why it is very possible that years later Jane Eyre came when she remembered her and placed it there on her own. The deaths of the children were not in vain, at least completely. Because of the number of sick and dead coming from the Lowood Institution, many people started questioning what had happened. From these deaths came serious questions about the need for things to improve at the school. Wealthy and influential people with greater hearts than Mr. Brocklehurst, the owner, demanded upgrades to the buildings and better conditions. They spent a lot of money and took over many responsibilities to keep the children healthy and properly learning. The former owner, Mr. Brocklehurst, was in effect placed as a figurehead. Jane Eyre herself had nowhere to go and spent eight years, two of them as a teacher, at this newly restored boarding school. She was very successful and became top of her class. She had become a respectable young woman by the time of her teaching appointment. It was a complete change from what she thought would happen when she arrived at first with the idea that she would again be abused because of the opinions of Mrs. Reed and what she told Mr. Brocklehurst, the now disgraced owner. Considering the success and comfort that she had, even though not with a lot of money, it would seem Jane Eyre could live her entire life at the Lowood Institute. It was not to be because a woman she respected a lot would carry on with her own life. 
Mrs. Temple, a teacher, when Jane first arrived, that had become the superintendent, met and married a reverend. Part of that new life as a married woman included leaving the school and going away. This upset the only personal connection Jane Eyre had with anyone at the school. She could be empathetic with individuals at a very intimate level, but then have to be with that person to feel any self-assurance. Jane Eyre felt unsatisfied with her life the moment Miss Temple left her alone. She became like a ghost in the hallways, wandering back and forth. All of her duties were taken care of, but her inner self was lost and dead. She struggled to regain some kind of a life, but decided the only way to do that was to leave the institution that she had known for so long. Having made that decision, she sent out inquiries for a new job at another place. Once she was hired and left, she was never to return. Leaving the school was described similarly to how Helen Burns explained what the afterlife was supposed to be like, according to her understanding. There was a wider world much better than the one she had lived, full of wonder. What lay outside of the small school could be beyond imagination. Jane Eyre reached out for that new life in hopes of making new friends and acquaintances. She described the school she spent eight years at as a cross between a prison and death. A passage to the new place included a quiet coach ride with one horse at a slow pace. In the distance, she could see lights filled with life and hope. The inn she stayed at seemed the barrier between the old life and anticipation of the new, complete with a painting depicting the death of an English king. Each instance when there was a change in location, the previous place was lost to time and the new and afterlife. When she inquired for permission, young as she still was, from Mrs. Reed and leave the school, the response was that she no longer cared what Jane did. She had been buried in the mind of Mrs. Reed, the same as Jane Eyre did, for that, many years ago. Once arriving at Thornfield Hall, the death motif continues with the dark hallways having only scattering of light. The homeowner who gives it life was gone. The old woman, Mrs. Fairfax, who took care of the place, made sure that it was always ready for when the homeowner arrived. She cannot hide all of the signs that the place was old and starting to become run down. Ancient carvings of strange animals, unusual scenes, and unknown people were found all over the place. No new updates of furnishings replaced the outdated feeling of the residents. At night, there was a sense of old souls lingering. Jane asked Mrs. Fairfax if there was any ghosts or hauntings in the hallways. She was answered that Thornfield Hall had no ghosts or even stories to tell about apparitions. She explained that the family that lived there had a lot of violence in their history. Because of the very active nature of their lives, it was not very conceivable that they would be haunting the hallways because they would probably be too tired to do something like that. During her tour of the mansion, Jane heard strange laughter coming from a room behind the door. The laughter and mysterious sounds were blamed on Grace, an attendant. This attendant was told by Miss Fairfax not to be so loud. Jane Eyre had her doubts that the truth was being told, but went about on her business. Soon, her new responsibility, the young Adelaide, arrived, and for the moment, she concentrated on her. Wanting to leave Thornfield Hall for a short time, she used taking a post to the nearest town as a good excuse. She started walking on the icy winter road and imagined the snow-covered fields and leafless trees covered in summer color and grazing animals. All around her, the death of winter brought a reminder it would not always be this way. Spring and then summer would once again return. Feeling the need to rest, she sits down and notices a shadow in the distance. A young mind is filled with scary possibilities as to who or what was approaching. Stories told to her by her governess, Bessie, before going to boarding school, came to mind. The approaching dog and horse was mistaken at first as a guy trash, or ghosts in the form of animals, coming her way. She was both frightened and intrigued by this new sight. Of course, it turned out to be a man on a horse riding along with his dog. Tragically, the man falls off his horse and gets hurt. Jane Eyre considers that the perfect opportunity to help the man and become useful, if only for a moment. It was a way to become sympathetic again and have a new purpose. Once again, the pain becomes an opportunity for Jane to define herself around another. The man isn't seriously hurt and he heads towards Thornfield Hall. Jane waves him goodbye and finishes her post-delivery. Once Jane returns to Thornfield Hall, she doesn't want to step across its boundaries. Like Lowood Institution and Gateshead Hall before that, she feels stuck and lifeless. 
she continues to find herself in a tomb after tomb while still alive. One single light shines through a window to signify there is some life behind the gray walls. Her hesitation is based on the moon at night, calling her to wander to other places, just like so many other times. Eventually, she gives in to her duties and enters the hall and the foreboding building. Inside is a new hustle and a bustle of activity. Something sets things in motion that had not been done before. Like Adelaide, the girl she was hired to teach and take care of, Mr. Rochester was now present to be looked after. Her third rebirth and incarnation was about to start. Click the subscribe button and notification bell to not miss the next installments and analysis.